Which is why they all sound exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and the you know, people that work for the television stations have the time to do the voices for the TV commercials, just you know, as part of them putting the commercials on the air. So there was sort of a sameness in, in, in terms of the sound of all these things. And, uh, and I, <coughs> I was good at doing things that didn't sound normal. I was doing crazy dialects and voices. And, and what I didn't realize is I was doing them at the age of 15 as good as a lot of what was on television at the national level. And um, anyway, I went to KU and started landing commercials that you were know, local and regional spots. And uh, went to Chicago, which was the nearest large market after I went to KU, and uh, got a job as a producer producing and writing television commercials. And, um, but then I would go on my lunch hour, I got an agent there in Chicago, and I would go audition for things. And within a few months, I was making more on my lunch hour than I was, you know, doing my other job, you know, 40 hours a week. So uh, I saved up some money, and uh, my wife and I at that time, we were married already, and uh, we chucked it all and went to L.A. just to see what could happen. So. And here I am. But, uh, yeah, I, uh, uh, I was a success right off the bat at, at almost every area of voiceover work. I, within two weeks of getting to L.A., I had the Chrysler Plymouth account as an announcer. I was doing promos for ABC, CBS, NBC, and Fox, all four networks. And couldn't get arrested, though, for cartoons. I, I must have gone two or three years auditioning for cartoons. Got absolutely nothing. So I was pretty much done. I said, well, obviously it's not meant to be. And which is funny, because that's why the agent signed me. They thought I was going to be the next big animation guy. And then uh, I advised my guy, okay, I went to home on my last audition. It was for the Wild Thornberries, and I got a lead in that. I was, I was down with the chimpanzee. <laughs> <laughs> so shortly thereafter, I got to uh, Professor, you told me I'm on the Powerpuff Girls. <laughs> I was also the talking dog on the Powerpuff Girls. She started shouting like this. Okay, yeah, sure, okay. Hey, girls. And then, uh, something else in Powerpuff Girls. Oh, him. I was the villain him, the one that was supposed to be the Satan. I was like, oh, hello. And I got Wild Thorn, no, and then I got the Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends. I was, I was Mr. Hedman, the big bunny rabbit. Miss Foster's rules are meant to be followed. Oh, by the way, if you're Powerpuff Girls fan, it's coming back. We, uh, we recorded a one-hour special that will be on, I think, in about three months. And if the ratings are good, they're going to order more seasons. So it may return. <laughs> anyway, I moved back. Uh, I was in L.A. for, uh, we were there for 20, 20 years and, uh, and started a family, and things were going great. But uh, I kind of maxed out. I, I, had reached the point where I couldn't do any more in a day because of traffic. You know, I would drive from here to here to here, and I started doing a lot of movie trailers. I do almost all the Disney Pixar films. It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's Disney Pixar's Toy Story 3. It starts Friday, you know, that sort of thing. You, know, you know, from the creators of Madagascar. Uh, but the, uh, 
it got to the point where physically I just couldn't get to any more places in a day's time just because of traffic. So I put a studio in my house and sort of trying to transition to work out of my home studio because obviously there's no commute. And uh, a lot of places just couldn't wrap their brains around that, the idea that I wouldn't come in. And like the quality of what I had at home was as good as anything in town. I had it built by some of the best engineers in, in Hollywood. And, um, and everybody had the same equipment where I could talk in my studio and they recorded it live in their studio with no delay. And it sounds like I'm there. I mean, I'm the voice of Disney Asia currently. And I did a session last night at 10.30 at night, which was about 11.30 in the afternoon, or in the morning rather, in Singapore <coughs> tomorrow. Um, <laughs> you know, so it sounds like I'm there in the studio. So. But a lot of them just really couldn't, yeah, because no one had done that yet. I was kind of the first guy of my, you know, level of success to chuck LA and say, I'm going to work from someplace else, deal with it. And uh, fortunately, they did, you know, and uh, some of the producers were like, you know, like, well, we're not going to have to, we can't worry about him anymore, he's not here. And the client would be like, what do you mean? Oh, he's, he works out of his own studio. And they're like, yeah, so, we want him. Well, yeah, but he's not here. So? <laughs> so anyway, it worked out fine because you know it's hard to tell a client they can't have what they want. So. Anyway, I'm actually busier than I've ever been. I'm working more than I ever did in LA. Um, I average anywhere from on a slow day three recording sessions and about ten auditions. Typical day four or five recording sessions and a dozen auditions. And busy day could be if I've got two or three movies at the same time. It gets really silly. I mean, my record was four. 14, 14 recording sessions in one day. Um, that was lucrative, and I don't want to repeat it very often because I was working for like 11 o'clock at night. But, um, so anyway, what do you want to know? I'm trying to figure out where I used to sit when I was in this room. <laughs> <laughs> There's probably, probably enough of my DNA in here. You could swallow it and clean me. I don't know. Guys, <laughs> <laughs> guys. Um, how has the industry changed since you started, and what advice would you give to someone who is maybe an inspiring voiceover artist? It, it's changed a lot um, from the technological point of view, um, simply because you can work remotely with no quality difference you know, uh, than, than there would be if you were in the studio. But it's, in a way, that's, that's, that's a been a bad thing for those of us that are already established because now instead of competing against a hundred guys that are in Los Angeles, I'm competing against a hundred guys in Los Angeles and another hundred in New York and another hundred in Chicago and 25 in Atlanta. And uh, fortunately, most of them aren't very good, or at least not good enough to, to be really good. I mean, it's just reality. I mean, if you, you know, when, when I first went to Hollywood, um, they would have a, a national network uh, television spot for say like Chevrolet trucks or something, Chevy trucks. And they would go to a casting facility, they would have 25 or 30 guys show up for the casting, you know, two or three from each of the 10 agencies. That same afternoon, they would have five guys out of that 30 come back for a callback. And either that same day or the next morning, they pick one. Which is that simple. Now, a cast for that same part, same commercial, the, cast, the casting session goes on for three days. They, they read 300 people. Their first callback is 50 people. Then they have another one that gets down to 10 or 15, and then they go down and pick the guy. And the funny part is, they're still ending up with the same guy. Because the reality is, there's only a certain number of people that are absolutely the best at what they do in any profession. There's only one Michael Phelps. There may be 500 other swimmers, that by our standards are freaking awesome, but there's only one Michael Phelps. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying I'm Michael Phelps, but there's definitely, there's, that's true in my profession as well. I mean, I can go to an audition with 10 guys that are picked by their agents, or I can go to an audition with 100 guys, and the same two or three of us are still gonna be the ones they come down to. It, it's just the way it is. Um, but the, uh, some of that's talent, some of that's experience both um, but the you know that being said every year there's new people that get into the industry people that no one's ever heard of and you know they're 18 19 20 21 and they've got some cool twist on some new voices and stuff 
and uh, you know, it, it, and again, the technology has made it possible for because again, like I said, when I was your age, didn't even know where Hollywood was. I never even heard the term voiceover. Didn't know what that was. I would say, you know, you know, the guy that's talking on the commercial, but you don't see him. Uh, but but the, uh, um, because of the technology, you have at your disposal machines now that will allow you to put your face on. Put, put your face on place. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, kind of creepy. <laughs> but you, you can, uh, you, know, you, you can find places that will actually work with you over the internet to, to make your voices. And there's two or three places in Hollywood: the Voicecaster, uh, Talk Shop LA, and one other that will actually tr help train you from wherever you are. You know, they'll, they'll you know you can talk to each other via Skype, and they can give you uh, you know suggestions and work with you on developing a voice or voices or whatever and put together a demo reel and you can send samples of something to them and they'll listen to it and go, no, that's not great. Do that. So, you know, the, the ability to do face-to-face -face training with someone that lives 1,800 miles away is possible now, which it certainly was not when I was your age. So, um, there's a lot of people uh, now all over the country that are trying to get into voiceover work because Partly, you know, partly it's, it's innocent. You know, they, they I, I love it when someone just kind of glibly reduces my entire 30-some year career to a, a whim. And it's like, oh, I've been thinking of getting into voiceover work. Really? I've been thinking of being a neurosurgeon. I've got a hand. I can hold a scalpel. What? I've got a big drill bit to get into the brain. You know, so it's like, yes, I'm not saying I'm a neurosurgeon, but it's also, you know, when you're a party with some 50-year-old guy who is a surgeon and he says something like that, it's like either he's had a couple too many drinks or he really thinks that what I do is just that completely stupid and meaningless and easy. And I'm like, hey, okay, sure. So, because, you know, he can talk, but that is unfortunately what you run into a lot of times. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, it, and you get it from professionals, too. I mean, I, I was an example. There's a guy named Mark Cashman that's putting together a book of quotes from famous voiceover people, things that we've been told or asked to do that are just patently ridiculous, but the client doesn't realize how ridiculous they are. So we're like, we're like he's putting a book together that only other voice, you know, he's going to sell probably 100 copies like me. Just because I can flip to my, there's my quote. Um, the one I contributed was, uh, 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 more than one time, I've had a client uh, look me in the eye and go, what I'm looking for is a dead-on John Cleese, who is, you know, the Monty Python guy. You know, the Ministry of City Walks! Right? <laughs> I want a dead-on John Cleese, but without the British accent. <laughs> <laughs> and every time I go, can I get a line reading on that? <laughs> because that's... That's, that's not possible. <laughs> it's just, again, it's just ridiculous. The other one I turned in was for a friend of mine who's no longer with us anymore. But I thought it would be nice to include him because he had some hilarious stories. He was doing an Oscar Mayer hot dog commercial one time. And the director was just being a real a-hole. The, <laughs> the client was there and he was trying to make sure everybody knew he was the boss director. And he was really just a jerk. And, uh, and you do run across that occasion. I've never seen him in the town since, so apparently people are tired of him. But, uh, he was like really giving Bob a hard time, you know. He's like, no, no, that's not the right. Thing. He goes, I, you got to give it. He was like giving these really vague directions. You got to do this and do that. And Bob's like smiling, okay, and he'd give him a different read. No, that's not it. And finally, Bob just, you know, gave him one last thing, and the director slams his hand down on him, and he goes, no, no, damn it, that's too hamburger. It needs to be more hot dog. <laughs> <laughs> And Bob just sat there like with a smile on his face and he goes, same thing, he goes, could you give me a line reading on that? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of selling this goes on. So anyway, questions? Yes? Um, do you have like a process or anything when you're about to do a voice or you just go for it? Like no, I don't, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, when you get to the point where I am, um, usually they're hiring me for something they've already heard me do. Um, very rarely does anybody hire me to come up with some new crazy voice. Um, especially, you know, especially in the commercial world, they don't even really know what to ask for. Um, and usually, when I, I'm, if it's something new, uh, it's something I've auditioned for. So they've already heard what they liked, which is why I'm, why I'm there. So it's usually already decided. It's like a, you know, I'll, I'll agree 
the copy and I put a certain sound to it and you know if they want either a retro sort of a you know the old the old radio guy a lot of time you know as the Nazi talk about walls across Western Europe America's boys and blue are there rising into the skies over London from the hardy hard you know if they want sort of a dead pad and you know whatever sort of thing, you know it just depends on what they want and I audition for that they'll describe it along with a hundred other guys, and they pick me. So by the time I get to the point where they're going to record me, that's what they want. I already know what they want. They know what they want, so I just do it. Um, but, but sometimes if it's a cartoon, you know, there really isn't, it, you'll get a sketch of the character, and they'll give a description. Now, sometimes it's easy, like with Mr. Harriman, you know, he's got a top hat and a monocle and a big bushy mustache, and they said sort of a British colonel, you know, so that was easy. It was just, I pulled out, you know, Blustery British voice number 3B. You know, and just, <laughs> 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 so that, that's for me. See, I've got a lot of voiceover guys do come up with cool new things. Like Todd, Billy West, who was Ren and Stimpy and Red m and and the entire cast of Futurama, and, and uh, uh, Tom Kinney, who's SpongeBob and is on uh, Adventure Time. And, you know, so some of these guys, they do come up with new and cool voices. And, uh, you know, Bill Bradley, D. Bradley Baker. I mean, he'll sit in front of a mirror and actually kind of contort his face to see what weird sounds he can get. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm lazy. I mean, I, I grew up in the golden age of television reruns, so if, if I get a spot that needs to be a, some old coot, you know, from a, in a Western sort of setting, I just pull out, you know, Gabby Hayes or Walter Brennan, who you guys probably haven't heard of, but. You know, they were, um, you know, um, oh, I know what you see, you don't know what you around here. You know, oh my goodness, you know, you're sort of a, you know, an old geezer. You know? And if you, if you shift that just a little bit to the right, you've got, you know, you've got the, uh, you've got Grandpa Simpson. <laughs> oh dear, I remember when the Kaiser came in, you know. So you can, you can just move things just a tiny bit and it's a different voice. So I'm, I'm basically just, you know, I just lift things that I grew up hearing and modify them and twist them. Like a Professor Utonium is, is actually a blend of me and uh, a guy named Gary Owens, who's still alive. Gary's pushing 80. But Gary was an announcer on the, a show called Laughing back in the 1960s. And he recently, a few years ago, you probably heard him doing old Navy spots, but he was a um, he was a um, the fickle finger of faith or goes to beautiful down Tom Burbank. It was like old Navy. You know, that, <laughs> so I, I basically took took, you know, Gary Owen's voice and then I lightened it up just a little bit and made him, you know, Professor Utonia. He's like, now girls, you've got to do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> you can get more Jojo's butt tomorrow. <laughs> and I actually asked Gary, I said, I'm, I'm doing this auditioning for this thing, I'm kind of ripping off your voice a little bit. And he goes, wait a little. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to Brito, you know, and he goes, he goes, eh, that's not bad. It's okay, you can have it. <laughs> we had a great time with it. Gary, uh, Gary and I and a few other people uh, had dinner at a really famous restaurant in LA called Musso and Frank's. It's old Hollywood. And uh, Gary brought a couple friends who were, you know, senior citizens. And uh, then there were young guys like me and Billy West and Tom Kenny and a bunch of young voiceover guys. And we just thought it was fun to get together. And we're sitting there. And this guy that Gary had brought, I'd never, never heard of a guy before. And, uh, and again, this is part of living in Hollywood. I'm like, so what do you do? And he goes, well, I'm pretty retired now, but I was a, uh, a, a music arranger. I'm, gonna, I'm not even sure what that is. What, do you, what does he mean? He goes, well, every artist likes to have their sort of spin on, on the kind of music they play. And so you take a standard piece of music and you kind of tweak it a bit so it will fit, you know, in today's case, Beyonce's voice or, you know, she won't sing it the same way that, you know, J-Lo would sing it. Or, so that was an arranger job, was to take the same pieces of music and then sort of rearrange the, the phrasing so it would so, sort of match the artist. And I go, oh, I said, I, they said, if you had done any for anybody I, I, I would have heard of? And he goes, uh, oh yeah, probably a couple guys. And he you know, didn't drop a name. And Gary turned to me and he goes, yes, you may have heard of one of his clients, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> he, goes, he was Frank Sinatra's arranger. I'm like, no. <laughs> he goes, yes, and another young man named Elvis Presley. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm sitting next to a freaking Hollywood legend. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, but, yes, questions? Yes. What was your favorite thing that you've done? 
Oh, well, there's different kinds of favorite things. My favorite cartoon in terms of uh, the character is, is Star Wars, because I'm, I'm, I'm a Star Wars nerd, and that's a, I'm the Wissy Yoda. Because I'm a Master Yoda fan. Can we have a size to you? So that, you know, just from a, a, you know, a geek out thing, that's my favorite character, but the, my favorite show to work on was Powerpuff Girls, because it was just a ball. Like, these people were so funny. It was like I'd come out of those sessions feeling like I needed to pay them. You know, just working with Tom Kenny and E.G. Daly, who E.G. was uh, Buttercup, she was also uh, Babe the Pig, and uh, Tommy Pickles on Rugrats, and, oh, man. and uh, tons of other things, and she was, uh, that was just always a hoot. Um, yeah, I was, and, you know, in terms of other kinds of announcing, uh, doing the Academy Awards is fun. I mean, that's because it's just such a bizarre, one-of-a-kind thing, you know, there's just nothing quite like the Academy Awards, it just, Crazy. I mean, you leave like you're not allowed to. Uh, you have to sign all this paperwork, you know, to swearing you to secrecy or something. You know? <laughs> and, and if you if you have a phone now and you're holding your phone up, if you're doing anything other than this, if you're like you're holding it out like this, which happened to me one time because I didn't have my glasses on, so I was like looking look at a photograph. I was all like that, and suddenly there's I'm flanked by two three hundred pound. You know, black guys who used to play for the, you know, the, the football team in town going, one of them goes, give me the phone. Why? And he goes, you'll take the pictures. Like, no, I wasn't. He goes, we're going to determine that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You're like looking through me, you know, don't pick it, because you're not allowed to take any photographs backstage or at all because they don't want the set to get out. And mainly they don't want, because all the celebrities show up with no makeup on. So the women especially are freaked out because you know they come from the gym and they got the you know sweatpants and a ponytail and they're practicing their opening the envelope and they're terrified of someone taking a picture of them with no makeup on and it's on the cover of the National Enquirer by you know who stars without makeup. Some of them I don't even recognize. I swear to God, you know these the people that do these makeup jobs on, on especially the women they're like two thousand dollar a day makeup people. They really do work magic. <laughs> and there, there were some celebs, they'll get up there and I'm, I'm just going, man, who's that? And the, my script supervisor was like, who's that? That's Naomi Watts. I'm like, really? <laughs> wow. That's just like every other girl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that is true. I, uh, I, uh, when, I, when, I give a, when I give a keynote address to people, one of the things I have with a computer and a projector is a... I do run through a whole bunch of things because one of the things I have to tell, especially to girls, you know, you guys, unfortunately, you, you see these people on camera and on interviews and you idolize the way they look and the way they sound because they're celebrities and therefore they must somehow have some opinion that is of some value. Well, the sad reality is uh, less than 10% of the members of the Screen Actors Guild spent one day in college. So 90% of them went no further than high school. About 17% of them never finished high school. Some of them are you know, Academy Award winning actors, never finished high school. Um, they're not all that bright. The reason they, that you think they're bright is because you're hearing them on screen most of the time mouthing words that they didn't write but were written for them by, oh, Someone who is bright went to college and got a degree in you know writing. So so when you you know when you hear Sean Penn talking brilliantly about something he knows absolutely nothing about, people just go, oh wow, he must know what he's talking about. Well, no, except that his friend, the scriptwriter, wrote that for him last night, so he doesn't sound like a moron. Um, and the women, you know, you look at these women in the magazines and in the, the movies, and you say, oh my gosh, they're so beautiful, and whatever. Uh, no, I've, I've seen them without makeup on. And without makeup on, nine out of ten of them don't look any prettier than most of you. They look just like you. A couple years older maybe, but they look like you guys. You could take 80% of the girls in the school, run them through the $2,000 a day makeup and hair and wardrobe and stuff, and trot them up on stage in the Academy Awards, and 90% of you would think they were somebody. Who is that? What was she been in? I don't know, but she looks like a movie star. Uh, it's it's all it's all smoke and mirrors. So. But, uh, any questions?
Yes. Like like people like Billy West, like do they ever just let you or like when you audition just like kind of like run the table and just like just come up with something to say like with animation stuff? Uh, or, well, you, they, you don't know. You don't come up with something to say. Say it's very scripted. Yeah. Um, there's very little. Well, no improv really to speak of. There are some shows that are like that where they do. It's an improv-based show, but not the cartoons. Mm -hmm. It's more like you know, Sunny in Philadelphia. Uh, that's kind of an improv a show where there's very little script. They just kind of say, okay, point of this scene will be this, and let's just make it up. <laughs> um, you know, so there, there are some like that. The, uh, you know, they, I don't, they, what's it called? There's a, a, a show that has three stoners that work in a, a workaholic. Workaholics. <laughs> workaholics. Workaholics. Yeah. <laughs> uh, boy, I get that one. So, I actually said to my kids one day, they were laughing, I'm like, either you're not very bright or you're all stone. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. Like, you're just too old, Dad. So, but yeah, but when it comes to cartoons, it's, it's, so, it's so planned out in advance. Um, because there's such a complicated process to get the cartoons to be finished. You, you, they really have to have something that's, that's pretty scripted. Because before we even record it, there's artists that are basing their, their preliminary work on those words. They're doing sketches, they're doing storyboards, they're doing whatever. And if you just sort of vamp and make it all up and change 20% of the script, suddenly they've got stuff coming through that's not even close to what they'd already sketched out, and they get mad and throw things. And, and, uh, so, and especially now, most of the animation's done overseas. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's been translated into you know, some other language, even. So that they can see it's a whole other layer of comfort. Are you kind of like the last step in the process? Yeah. Like... Um, well, no. We're, we're sort of a, a third of the way through the process. Mm -hmm. They write the script, they storyboard the script, um, which is, you know, frames. Then they record us. And then they take the framework and, and our voices and then finish the animation to match the lip flap. Although you can't go the other way around. Yeah. If, you, if you do the cartoon and it's finished, and then you try to lay voices into it, it sounds horrible. It's, it's why uh, dubbed stuff from like anime always sounds so funky, because you're, you're trying to match a different language lip flap, yes. And it will never work. Oh, I see, yes. Ah! <laughs> You know, because it's already there, and you're stuck with what, what's there. Well, it, it, even though it, you were doing English to English, it still would be weird because the, the animator is an animator. They don't, they don't, they're not an actor. They don't know whether you're going to go, go. Uh, oh, hey, how you doing? Or oh, hey, how you doing? So, well, the completely different facial expressions are required for that. They don't know what you're going to do. It's just word, oh, hey, how you doing? Words on the page. So they have to have that first. So they go, oh, and they'll draw the big mouth, and ah, you know. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's really the only way to do it that's efficient. Just kind of a stupid question, but more no, like. My <laughs> Seth MacFarlane, uh, you kind of spoke a little bit that you're trying to like maybe work with him between mm -hmm. you and another voice actor, but like, have you. Had a chance to really like sit and talk with him, and maybe had some back and forth between like his like voices and your voice. I mean, I'm just kind of no, curious. No, like... no. Well, Seth. First of all, Seth is he's he's an odd duck uh, in, a, in a way, and he's also uh, I don't know how to say this politely, very full of himself. <laughs> but he has reason to be. You know, right. at the age of thirty, they, he signed an eighty million dollar contract <laughs> to develop three cartoons. And he's got the three highest rated cartoons on the air other than The Simpsons. So well, I guess he's got some reason to be full of himself. Um, but he does almost all the voices himself. He'll bring, now that he's, his shows have gotten bigger and bigger budgets, he, he's got like this circle of friends that he'll bring in, like him and Patrick Stewart are buddies. That's how Patrick Stewart ended up being a character on the CIA director on uh, what, American Dad. And, he was, he, and Patrick was the narrator of the movie tape. Um, and I ended up doing all of the trailers as Patrick Stewart because he wouldn't do them. But the um, uh, so you know he's got some celebrities that he'll bring in, you know Mark Wahlberg and Henry Blood. So there really isn't unless you're part of his little clique. 
you know, he doesn't really hire you, and it doesn't it doesn't matter with if they're a big voice for you. I mean, he doesn't hire Billy West, he doesn't hire Tom Kinney, he doesn't hire Jesse. I mean, he hires basically himself, and if he really needs another voice, he'll try to go for a celebrity. So, which is unfortunate because he didn't used to be that way. He used to actually hire real voice over people, but sometimes, very often, when these people get big, they uh, decide they want to become star and uh, hang out with them. So, I mean, Pixar is the best example of that when. When Brad Bird was doing Iron Giant before he was at Pixar, that's all he used was real voiceover people, and you know he would really get down on on you know animation studios that hire celebrities just for no reason other than their name because very rarely do they really bring the best voiceover to the character. I mean, Cameron Diaz is what it was Princess Fiona, who was bland, who was bland. Um, but. You know, oh, but it's Cameron Diaz. I mean, we had, I did a movie once where they brought Bruce Willis in to be a dog, and they ended up paying Bruce Willis as more than four of us put together. And he was actually going to be the voice of Spike. It was a Rugrats movie when Spike could talk. And we had this wonderful moment of revenge where, because it was at the premiere, Willis is there with his daughters, and, and um, this, you know, we're up with this big. You know, the, the red carpet thing, the whole thing. We're all sitting there, all of us cast are there, and we're all still kind of grumbling about the fact that Bruce Willis was shoehorned into our movie uh, at the last minute. And, um, and uh, up on the screen comes the first moment Spike the dog talks. Well, I, you know, I've just seen Rugrats. Spike is this kind of goofy, sleepy hound. He doesn't do much. He kind of turns around three times and falls asleep again. Well, Bruce did his sort of trademark, Bruno, hey! sort of thing, which nothing remotely like Spike. And we were all just coming up. So the movie's there, it's about 10, 20 minutes in the movie, and all of a sudden, for the first time, Spike talks, and he says something, and this little voice comes out of the darkness. My guess is like a four or five-year-old girl. Just, and nobody knows who it was, because the theater was dark, but all we heard was, Mommy, that's not Spike. <laughs> <laughs> and Spike had never spoken before, but she knew. That was not Spike. <laughs> and we all, I, I turned to I, Nancy Cartwright, was sitting right behind me and to the right. She was, she's the voice of Bart Simpson. And she went, <laughs> But uh, sometimes we get a little bit there. But yeah, that is an unfortunate trend that's been going on for a long time. That, you know, they try to cram as many celebrities into their cartoons as possible, it, which is, you know, Ridiculous. No five-year-old is going to jump up and down and say, Mommy and Daddy, I want to go see the new Mark Wahlberg cartoon. You know, uh, you know, I hear Mike Myers is in a new cartoon. No, you didn't hear that, honey. <laughs> so, yeah, and that's, that's just it. Doesn't sell another ticket, but I guess it allows the executives to go home and tell their golf buddies who they got to have dinner with last night. <laughs> yeah, anything else? Oh. Yes. Um, did you consider any other um, professions? Um, yeah, uh, I, I mean, because I didn't know that, that being like a cartoon voice was a viable way to make a living at that time. I was, you know, the kid here. And uh, by the time I got out of college, though, um, uh, I went through the radio and television film program at KU, which doesn't exist anymore now. I think it's called Communication Arts. Or something. But for the first time, I was exposed to video equipment and really, by today's standards, really primitive editing, you know, machinery. There was no, there was no software yet, no computers. Uh, now you've got stuff that, you know, would have left half the people in Hollywood drooling, just the stuff you have on your Macs. But um, that's the other thing I think if I wasn't uh, a voiceover guy, I'd be an editor, a video editor, film editor, because that, that's... I've done a lot of that over the years um, for various things. Um, it's, a, in my opinion, it's just a wonderfully creative uh, element, you know, because you basically are taking just a pile of stuff, you know, that was shot out of sequence, out of order, different days, different weeks, different whatever, and you've got to somehow make a coherent story out of it, you know, visually. Um, so I yeah, I probably not here. So, yes. Um, how do you feel about like people who have done big roles like Mark Hamill, but then go on to be voice actors? Well, it depends on who they are. Mark, Mark belongs in voiceover work. He's brilliantly good at it. 
And, um, and I don't think he would have ever discovered that talent had he been someone other than Luke Skywalker, because he, that, what happened to him happens to a lot of stars, where they become so identified with a specific role, they can't work anymore. And Mark's definitely that. It's like he, he, he just could not get arrested in Hollywood after the Star Wars movies, because who, who, he, a movie, the only way a movie works is it's called the willing suspension of disbelief. For that 90 minutes or 120 minutes, you have to shut off that part of your brain that goes, oh, come on, that's just silly. Oh, he wouldn't do that. He's only 5'5". Five, five. You have to, it's, again, that's, that's a great, if you haven't heard it, it's a great phrase. It's the willing suspension of disbelief. You willingly, voluntarily shut off your disbelief mechanism. And so for that two hours, well, sure, there's star cruisers and like Darth Vader and uh, swashbuckling Han Solo, it's perfectly reasonable, and you, you, that way you, that's how you enjoy movies. Um, the problem is anything that, that breaks that, that, that breaks that moment, is, is, a, is killer to a movie. And that's what happens if, if you're watching a Western, and you're into the Western, and all of a sudden this character walks in, and it's Luke Skywalker. Because that's the first thing they start going to go through your head. It's not going to be, oh, it's Mark Hamill, that actor that played Luke Skywalker. It's like, oh my God, it's Luke Skywalker. And so suddenly you're like totally gone. You're out of the movie. You've just been ejected from that Western. And now you're thinking about Star Wars. And, oh, gosh, I haven't seen him in a year. And it completely ruins the moment. I mean, the, the, it's, again, it may not mean anything to you guys because it was before your time. But there was a movie called Saving Private Ryan that Tom Hanks was in. Massive World War II battle, just epic battle, the best World War II movie ever made. And they're, they're, they've gone through this just horrendous thing, half the guys are shot to death, and they're marching through this town in France, and it's just blown to rubble, and some lieutenant commander comes around the corner, and it's Ted Danson, who was Sam Malone on Cheers. <laughs> and it, it was one of those moments. Every single person in every single theater in every single town and city had the same reaction. Oh, it's Sam Malone from Cheers! <laughs> Which is deadly. You don't, you, that's the last thing you want to happen. And it did. I, people like, oh, you know, people like were murmuring. Oh, it's Sam Malone from Cheers. I'm like, okay, that ruined that. And it takes you like five minutes to get back into the movie and forget that that's Sam Malone. Every time he opens his mouth, it's like, well, that's Sam Malone. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that that's, does happen to a lot of celebrities. And it did happen to Mark. He started getting a voice of work because he was broke. You know, and, he, and they were like, and so he, you know, they, in the cartoon world, they were like, heck yeah, he's a celebrity. Let's, you know, he'll do it. And of course, he came up with some fantastic stuff. I mean, the, his Joker is just brilliant. His Joker was so good that uh, when they were casting for uh, The Dark Knight, which ultimately they gave the Joker to Heath Ledger, it was actually down to three guys, and Mark Hamill was one of the three. They were actually considering using Mark as the Joker on, in Batman because the voice was so amazingly good. So, but yeah, there are a few, few celebs that belong in voiceover. You know, right? Most of them, they do their voice, and that's all they do. And it's like, okay, you sound like Bruce Willis every time you talk. So. <laughs> yeah. Have you done any like video game, like voiceovers or whatever? Oh, I feel God. like that industry's kind of like a hundred of them. I don't know. You'd have to look at my IMDb page. I've seen them. weak voices in that too. I, I generally, I actually kind of, on purpose, kind of gotten out of that mm -hmm. because there was. Uh, as I got busier and busier doing other things, I, it just, it's too hard on your throat. Like, from, like now the only video games I'll do is uh, are all the Star Wars properties. Um, and uh, I'll, do, I'll do some for Warner Brothers. Um, I'm, I'm Gandalf for all the, uh, all the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit games. Because again, there's, there's not much screaming, yelling, or dying. <laughs> and that's what our agents will ask. Like, Gandalf never dies. Yeah, we'd like them to do whatever. And the first thing we see is how much screaming, yelling, and dying is there. And if there's a lot of screaming, yelling, and dying, we're going down and we'll pass. Because again, if, you know, you spend three hours doing, you know, that. Well, <laughs> you know, the rest of the afternoon, you kind of sound like this. <laughs> well, yeah, I do know. Gandalf is good. Shut up, pals! <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, but I, I pick and choose for games right now. If it's a big thing, like gamble. Yeah. Are you a one-take voice actor? 
Uh, sometimes. <laughs> um, you know, but it, it's, it's, it may be one take to them, but usually what they don't understand is I've already read it five or ten times. I auditioned for it. I read it two or three times and I auditioned for it. The morning of the session, I could get it in my email and I kind of look over it a couple times and kind of run through it for timing so that, you know, when they finally connect up with my studio, because this, this happens a lot, I'll get, uh, I'll get a piece of copy that 20 people have read. It's been written by a copywriter and approved by the creative director and the clients have read it. And not one person out of the entire process read it out loud and timed it. They read it in their head. Which you know, makes sense, except what most people don't realize is when you read something in silently in your head, you read it 20 to 25 percent faster than if you read it out loud. So people are reading it in their head and they're looking at the clock and Oh, 30 seconds is perfect. Suddenly I'm reading it and it comes out 40 seconds. And they're like, well, what happened? We timed this, it was 30 seconds. I go, did you read it out loud? Well, no, that's what happened. <laughs> like, read it out loud. And suddenly they do and it's 38 seconds. Oh, okay. So yeah, always read, always read your scripts out loud because A, you'll, you'll write, it'll also, it's also harder to, to stomach bad writing if you hear it coming out of the mouth versus in your head. Because in your head, when you're reading bad writing, your head kind of makes it better. It fixes it. It kind of puts an inflection on it that makes it, you know, because your brain wants to try to make whatever piece of garbage you're reading into something worth reading. So you kind of automatically do adjust things in your brain. When you read them out loud and you're actually hearing the words, you know, like, oh, oh, that's cheesy. No one would say that. You know, so, yeah, always get me, and people think you're nuts, but I, that's part of why I've gotten where I am. I talk to myself all the time. <laughs> there are people who think I'm just raving nuts because, it, you know, I'd be, well, I'm, I do it today. I'll go to the grocery store this afternoon, and if I'm walking down the cereal aisle, I'll go, four <coughs> flakes, they're great. <laughs> Charms, they're magically delicious. <laughs> a sandwich just isn't a sandwich without the tangy zip of Miracle Whip Brand salad. Yeah, so, I mean, I do that all the time because it's, it's my way of practicing. You know, so. but, yeah, some mothers are grabbing their children. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy, man. I'm out for it. But, uh, but I have the last laugh. <laughs> Did you do like the Pepperidge Farms too? Like, yeah. I did actually. Uh, every weekend, a couple dozen Kansas City family. You know, yeah, it was 1953. Pepperidge Farms. <laughs> uh, I've done that before. Uh, I think I've done anything recently. With, with, uh, McDonald's? Oh, I did tell you. Yeah, I got, I did, you you I ruined my, my uh, travel to school every morning. <laughs> I was listening to music right and I get talking. a professor, some German professor, I think. Where it's no, that's Norwegian cruise line. Yeah, I've got two or three McDonald's spots right there in a given time, so I don't know which one it is, but something exciting on the dollar menu. I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Um, do you feel like your time at South kind of inspired you to do what you do or kind of prepared you for it? Well, yeah, I mean I uh, this was the first time in my life where I got involved in things like theater and, and the radio and television class where you, know, you were forced to stand up in front of other people, um, some of whom you liked, some of whom you didn't like, some of whom wanted to be with up after school, uh, but, uh, and had to actually you know, not sound like an idiot. So, and that's a terrific experience. Because if you guys can get to the point where you can stand up in front of this class or some other class, and just talk, you know, and learn to look at people and make eye contact and stuff. That that will be a, a skill that will be of immense value to you for the rest of your life, even if you never do a commercial. It, that's that's actually, I believe, when people are asked to rate the number one fear they have, that's always like one or two. One is drowning. Two is public speaking. I mean, there are people that are CEOs of major corporations that have to get up and do what I'm doing, and literally you don't see their hands because they're sitting there behind the podium going, oh, good. No. and they wear a jacket because they're pitting out on the <laughs> 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 and, 
if you can get past that, then, then uh, it, it really, it's a great thing to work on. Every time you do something in this class where you are able to talk to the other class or talk to a camera or talk, get better at it, work at it, get, get past the fear of standing up in front of people, whether it's 25 people or 25,000 or, you know, live to the Oscars, which is a third of a billion, they'll hear me screw up if I screw up. But if you can get to that point, it, it will, again, it will be just immeasurably valued to, you as you, valued to you as you go through life because very few people can do that, can master that fear of failure, rejection, whatever, in front of everybody. And when, and, when you, and when you have mastered that, when you have no problem whatsoever coming up in front of a group of people, okay, hi, how you doing? What's your name? All right, hey, how, what's your name? And, you know, talk to people. It, 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 that would translate to every job interview you ever have. You'll be able to walk in, have, pop the resume down, and think, well, listen, there's only one person. I've done this in front of 200. So, yeah, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and here's, what and here's what I've done, and there's a confidence that you'll have that other people won't have. Uh, they'll be, you know, most people who sit there not making eye contact and they're like, oh, well, I, I worked at um, I know, in my Walmart. And, uh, and you guys won't have that if you want to take care of this. So. Anything else? Yes? No? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned how you kind of you talk to yourself in the, the grocery store or something, maybe freaks some kids out. No, yeah, well, I talk to myself at home, I talk to myself at the store. I, yeah. Do you ever just bring out some voices while you know, everyday activities? Ordering at a restaurant. Uh, well, I used to. When I was your age, I used to, really, <laughs> I used to really mess with the you know, pizza hut. <laughs> and when I was in Los Angeles, I, 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 I was careful not to say anything to get me arrested. But I, was, you know, I, I spent four or five hours a day on the road when I lived in LA. So uh, there was a talk station I would listen to. So I would call up the station as various celebrities. <laughs> and I never said anything that would reflect badly on the celebrity. You know, I, I never made Morgan Freeman look like a fool. So if they found out it was me, he wouldn't sue me. But, but the simple fact that they thought it was Morgan Freeman calling in on the, whatever the topic was, suddenly, boom, you're at the front of the line. <laughs> so I'd be sitting there driving around and get the, I'd be like, I'd be like ah, you know, I want, want to yell at whoever was doing whatever they're thinking. And, so I thought, well, it's just me calling out, they don't care, but if it's, you know, Patrick Stewart or Morgan Freeman or, you know, Sean Connery or something, suddenly, suddenly I'm on the air. <laughs> Hi, this is Morgan Freeman, and you're a photograph. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> I only order pizza in a funny voice once, though, I'll do it. I'm going to realize it doesn't work, and no one's going to believe that Sean Connery is living in all the time. Ordering pizza. Yes, anything else? Yeah. Yes. Uh, who are some of your favorite people to work with, be it like a director or another actor? Or... Oh, well, uh, well, a lot of actors. I mean, you know, Billy West is just you know, like natural wonder. I mean, this, you know, the stuff he comes up with. It is just funny. Um, he is one of those guys that the directors kind of just back away and just let him go. Director-wise, um, oh god, they change on every project, so it's hard to know. The, guy, the director I have on the down the spot today will be a completely different guy tomorrow. So there's no real director that I have any consistency with, to like or dislike. Um, but in the animation world, uh, yeah, there's a well, there's a couple. Of, they're all women, which is odd. It's one of those areas where women dominate. Almost all the major directors for the big television series, cartoon series, are women. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's just something you don't see in Hollywood, certainly. Um, but uh, Andrea Romano, she's at Warner Brothers, does most of the Warner Brothers stuff. And Colette Sunderman, she does Cartoon Network. And, uh, they're, they're Yeah, just a little bit different. Yes. Um, I guess, like, I guess cartoons in the past, they would, like, hire, um, we're not trying to say it's, like, a time difference at all, but uh, they would hire voice actors to do, you know, like, uh, kids' voices, like uh, Bart Simpson. Uh, but, like, have you ever had experience working with, like, actual, like, young people, young children in that? Uh, most of the time it doesn't work out so well. Right. Um, because as talented as they might be, they're still little kids. 
and what passes for a talented actor in an eight-year-old wouldn't be considered good enough to, if, if it was a 28-year-old. So they kind of cut them some slack because it's an eight-year-old. Um, so that's why they hire women uh, to do children's voices. I don't know if you guys know that, but almost every cartoon you've ever seen, if it's a little boy or a little girl's voice, it's actually a grown woman. Um, you know, Bart Simpson is a 57-year-old woman now with three kids. Uh, the Powerpuff Girls, the youngest of them, was 30-something. Um, E.G. was Buttercup, is probably pushing 60 now. But um, the, uh, the real kids, sometimes they work out well, um, not, not always. But when they do work out well, they're just astounding. Because when you meet a kid that can act as well as an adult, that's just shocking. Um, Dakota Fanning was one. Um, Dakota started doing stuff when she was, she's four years old. I worked with her first when she was maybe six. And she had the poise, the, the bearing of a 40-year-old professional. It was just ridiculous. I mean, some kind of weird mutation. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Dakota was like that. Um, the kid that played Mac on uh, Foster's Home was an actual kid. He was like 13 when we started doing it. And uh, he was great. But they had, <laughs> of course, they hired, you know, they hired this 13-year-old. He hadn't gone through puberty yet. And, uh, about halfway through the second season, he did. So suddenly they're having to futz with his voice because suddenly his voice went from up here down there. Oh, 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 oh. And he ended up getting this deep voice. He started selling a man. And they had to pitch his voice back up, so it sounded like a kid. Anything else? Did that, did that horn mean you guys have to be going somewhere? Are you going? Oh, good. Oh. You can't. Well, I'll keep talking. <laughs> Anything else I can tell you? What else do you want to know? Do your kids ever request anything? Oh, not, not, not so much. Uh, no, they, they grew up with me doing this, so to them it's just what dad does for a living. You know, and they, ooh, that's a big thing. It's a golden one. They, uh, yeah, the time it was kind of, it, it, when they were little kids, they, they uh, enjoyed me reading them books, you know, because I would give them voices and make, make them more interesting. So. But like there was a, I mean, it, when you do this all the time, sometimes the kids, when they get a little older, when they're six or seven or eight years old, they know that that's, that character on television, they get it, that's not real, that's dad doing the voice. And it, it kind of ruins it for them. Yeah. So, you know, once they get to a certain age, I just read the book and don't put voices on it because I'm hoping to preserve a little bit of that, that uh, charm. I mean, I remember I was talking to Jim Cummings about that exact same, same thing. He's, he's the voice of Winnie the Pooh and Tigger. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, because my kids were a little younger than his girls. And he goes, yeah, you'll, you'll be there in a couple of years. And it does break your heart of my blood. He goes, oh, he goes, oh a couple of years ago, I was reading the Winnie the Pooh book. You know, there was four-year-old. And he goes, you know, of course he's doing his own, you know, Winnie the Pooh. And I, he got about four or five pages into it, and all of a sudden she like puts her hand on the book. She says, Daddy, can you just read it? And he goes, well, I am reading it. She goes, no, just read it. You read it, not, not in the Winnie the Pooh voice. And he goes, why? And she goes, it kind of ruins it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, but I am the voice of Winnie the Pooh. She goes, but I don't want you to be Winnie the Pooh. I want Winnie the Pooh to be Winnie the Pooh. He's like, oh, OK. It does get to be a little weird. Because I've got two three-year-olds, and they, yes, at my age, it's insane. Some people collect cars, and my wife collects children. <laughs> but yeah, we have two toddlers at home, and uh, they, they're they hooked on on Star Wars. They, they just, they don't, they're just now starting to call it Star Wars or Clone Wars. Um, up until recently, they just called it Boom Boom, because <laughs> Because the Hallmark has sent me these little toys that you like hit a button, and one of them was Vader's theme, and it would go bum, 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 bum. So to them, that's what that show is bum, bum. bum. <laughs> Can we watch bum, bum? Sure. But uh, yeah, uh, so I've actually been sort of toning down the amount of Yoda. I'll let slip out because I want them to think that Yoda's Yoda and not bad. Give them a little bit of yes. Speaking of just kind of like figuring out who the voices are, you know, from a family kind of perspective, uh, 
and this just kind of kind of goes along with like the nature versus nurture kind of aspect. Do you suspect that like even though you're you know you're you know, kids are going to grow up, do you think they might have, like, a certain voice? Not like they're going to go that direction, but you just, do you, did your dad ever have something like that, or was that ever passed on? This is totally just you. No, in my case, it was just lightning hitting, I guess. I, <laughs> no one in my family has ever been involved in any aspect of the entertainment industry or done any silly voices or anything, so. And my own kids don't seem to care. I mean, I was, I've tried a few times to see if there was any interest in, in the boys especially, because there's a lot more, statistically it's just a fact, there's very little work out there for women. Um, yeah, no interest. You know, one of them wants to be a cook, one of them wants to be a video editor, one of them wants to be a doctor. You know, that's cool. But, uh, I just wish, I just want but yeah, as to what I just said, it is it is much more difficult for women to get really a, a career going in voiceover work because there just isn't as much of it out there. Um, the Screen Actors Guild keeps track of commercials by you know ethnicity and race and sex and all this stuff, so they can kind of get an idea of who's working. And um, um, I think it was. Probably 2005 or six was the first time women broke 10% of the voiceover work. So just by being a woman, you're limited to all 10% of what's out there. And uh, because there's, except for cartoons, where there's more women jobs because they're playing kids. So they play the women, but they also get to do the kid with us. But, um, but generally, uh, you know, like all the movie trailers, 100% done by men. Um, most of the promo work for the networks, you know, you know, tonight on ABC, it might be simple. And almost probably 80% of that, 97% of that is men. Um, and it's not that the directors are being sexist because half the time the producers that are doing this are women. I mean, on the on the other side of the microphone, on the production side, women are very well represented, if not the majority. So, you know, there's a there's plenty of uh, opportunity to, to be the producer of the, the trailers or of the promos or the commercial. If you're a man or a woman, that doesn't seem to make any difference anymore. But in terms of the performers, they, for whatever reason, just, you know, they focus group this of audience, they test it every once in a while, they'll do a trailer with a woman, they'll do a trailer with a man. Doesn't matter the composition of the focus group, they always go, the dude's stronger, it sounds like a cooler movie, it's more action, more whatever. So I think some of that's just biological hardwiring on our part. You know? we're, we're sort of, I think, pre, uh, preconditioned to think of the tall, muscular, you know, guy as, as the savior and the superhero and not the five foot two, you know, librarian. <laughs> I think that's just that's the way we're made. But, uh, that's my opinion. But, uh, but yeah, it's a, it is a weird, it's a, it's a weird business. And you, and you know, you can get into it, again, for the first time in history, you're able to get a foot in the door without having to live there. I mean, there are commercials in Kansas City. There's actually two, two or three talent agencies, both of whom have a fairly vibrant uh, voiceover division. Um, now, you know, if you're in a smaller market like Kansas City or Omaha or Cleveland or something like that. Most of the work that's done will be uh, commercials and uh, like what's called non-broadcast stuff, which is like corporate, you know, presentations that Sprint, you know, I mean, Sprint has a whole audiovisual department over there that makes videos to show their corporation, you know, up to various things. But, um, most of those jobs don't pay great. They're 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 non-union, which is again in the world of performing, you want to get to the point where the jobs are uh, are union, meaning they're uh, part of the Screen Actors Guild or, or AFTRA, and those are the two big performers unions that have now since merged, um, simply because they're better jobs. The work is better, the pay is better, the, you know, it's, it's just all around, those are better commercials to get. But there are many, there are not many of those in Kansas City. You have to get a bigger market like, you know, Houston, Chicago, New York, LA, Atlanta, you know, where 
where the uh, talent is good enough that they sort of like, you know, I'm not going to take $100 to do your commercial. So. <clears throat> but yeah, there's also online services or casting services online, Voice Voice 123, Video Planet. There's several places that you can pay 50 bucks or 300 or whatever the fee is per year. And every day in your email box, they'll send you commercials for their paying jobs to audition. And obviously, you have to have some way to record a sample at home of an audition. Mm -hmm. You just email it back. And you might get hired. Somebody does. But uh, yeah, I've actually had to, my manager signed me up for one of the ones that actually got some decent sized jobs on at one time. And I've had to like contact them and say, can you, is there some filter you can apply? Because I was getting like 50 a day. Yeah, I'm like, well, I don't, you know, don't, you don't need to send me the $25 voiceover jobs because I just don't have time for those. We'll see. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. What's your answering machine like? Do you just oh, <laughs> couldn't be more bland. Uh, hi, this is Tom. Leave your name and number. I'll call you back. Uh. <laughs> I, I, as someone who has called many, many people, I, it drives me nuts when someone tries to put, you know, war and peace. On their phone answering machine, and stuff. <laughs> just say hi. I'm not here to talk. But, but I do like my kids. They ask me to do weird things, like my wife, my wife's her iPhone messages, uh, Professor Newtonian. <laughs> my daughter Sam's is uh, Morgan Freeman is in March of the Penguin. <laughs> my kids, I do that for, not me. My temperature is 75 below zero. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, fooled the sun once. I was doing a, a robot chicken parody of, of the March of the Penguins for uh, Seth Green, and they were editing it. And Alphonse Freeman, which is Morgan's son, is friends with Seth. Um, so Alphonse is coming in while they're editing it, and he hears, you know, the voice coming out of the, of the screen, and he goes. Well, he said, what, dude, he goes, what, you, why, why didn't you tell me you needed my dad for something? Why did you? And he goes, that's not, he goes, it's not your dad. And he goes, what? He goes, of course it's my dad. He goes, no, it's not your dad. It's some white guy in Kansas. <laughs> 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 and he goes, he, 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 he used the word again. He word was, he's like, and he goes, no. He goes, I'm not kidding, man. And he goes, no, no way. And he goes, he, Alphonse pulled his phone out. Beep, 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 beep. And his dad's like, hello. <laughs> and he's like, Dad, listen to this. Did you do this? And he played a few minutes of it. No, it's not. That's not me. It's <laughs> <laughs> on the golf course somewhere. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm never going to top that. I have to be for full of this uh, but, uh, Yeah, but that can get in trouble sometimes. Too. I, was, uh, I was announcing the AFI Lifetime Achievement Award for Sean Connery. And um, he was. Again, I don't know if you know Sean Connery, but he was James Bond for a lot of films. He was the dragon and the last dragon. And, uh, you know, he's an old Scotsman and he sounds like this now. His voice is getting a little raspy. And um, the whole evening, every single person that got up to talk would try to do a Sean Connery impersonation. And after about the 15th person that was trying to do a really bad Sean Connery impersonation, he was kind of going, oh, yeah, great. And, uh, the only one that came close was Mike Myers, who did a fairly decent one. So anyway, fast forward, we're, we're at Wolfgang Puck's for the after party, and I'm standing at the bar, and there's some guy, I don't know, right here, and up walks John to the bar. And the, the, the bartenderess was probably 22 years old, 23. She's frantically you know, making drinks and doing stuff. And she comes up um, to the guy, the strange guy, and she goes, okay, you're next, what do you want? And he goes, oh no, please, you know, Take, take him, it's his party. Mm -hmm. And she just looked up and was like, no, you're next, what do you want? And I, we all realized she doesn't know who this is. And uh, the guy says, okay, I'll take a, you know, whatever, Heineken. And she gets a shooter, she turns to me, and she goes, okay, you're up. And I'm like, no, really, please, take his turn. And John goes, that's all right. And I'm like, okay, I'll go, Roman go. And uh, finally she turns to Sean Connery, who, the reason that, you know, Steven Spielberg's there, and George Lucas, and Harrison Ford, and you know, um, and he goes, uh, he's, he's, he said, oh, I'll have a mahola, some scotch, you know, neat, which is no ice. And the guy next to him goes, 
oh, aren't you going to get a vodka martini shaken not stick, which is James Bond's line. <laughs> it gets about that far, and, 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 uh, and Sean goes, oh, bloody hell, don't say that. Because if I had a dollar for every time someone said that, I'd be richer than I am. <laughs> and uh, the guy's like, oh, okay, whatever. And he turns to me and he goes, so, so, he goes, so what do you do at the shindig? And I said, uh, well, I was the announcer for the show. And I was just the voice you heard coming in. He goes, oh, yeah, that's all bad. I said, thank you. I said, yeah, yeah, I could tell you were getting a little, you know, peeved of all the people trying to do their best Sean Connery impersonation. He goes, oh, you have no idea. He goes, it doesn't matter where I go in the world, who it is, everyone thinks I can do bloody me. And uh, I said, well, I've actually been hired to do your voice a couple times. He goes, for what? And I said, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. It was when he goes, oh, that piece of shit. Because I mean, like, barely he got in a fight with the director. Literally, a fight. <laughs> Once that happened, um, he finished the movie and walked away. He would not pr promote it. He wouldn't do any ADR. He wouldn't fix any lines. So they had to hire me to fix some of the bad lines in the movie. Because Sean was like, you know, is my contract done? I'm out of here. He left it. So anyway, I'm sitting there. It's a loud bar. Everything's thumping music stuff. He goes, all right, let's hear it. And I'm like, what? He goes, come on. He goes, every wanker and his brother in here has been doing my voice. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I said, I'm hoarse. I can't. He goes, oh, come on. So I lean forward in his ear, and I go, I go the league is set. The game is on. <laughs> and he leans back, and this is, I love this. He leans back, and he goes, it's not bad. I've heard better. <laughs> I'm like, OK, well, it's never, never, never a problem being brought down there. I told that the next day I was in my, my uh, in the lobby of my agency in Los Angeles, and Sh uh, Sean's son Jason was there. And I told him, I said, I said, the, everyone started laughing. He goes, Yeah, that, that sounds like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yes, any other questions? Yes. Do you ever get over cringing at the sound of your own voice, or do you? Yeah, you do actually. Uh, it, it takes a long time because when you hear yourself play back, of course, it doesn't sound at all like it sounds in your head. But, you know, I wear headphones, and I have for 30-some years, and I, I've gotten to the point where I, I don't hear my actual voice anymore in my head. I, I know now what it sounds like, as weird as it sounds, and so talking to you right now, I'm not really paying attention to, to what it sounds like in my head. I'm kind of hearing almost a ghost of it as what it sounds like through a pair of headphones. So and that just takes time. But yeah, you do get that eventually where you don't. You don't really pay attention to what it sounds like when you're doing. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it is completely different because you, you know, you've got a resonance and stuff that you know your, you know, your, all your hearing mechanism is surrounded by fluid, and so it's just vibrating directly up through this fluid. Um, and fluid is a far better conductor of sound than air. I mean, people don't realize that, but everybody thinks that when you're a woman's pregnant. That the baby, like it sounds weird, like the baby can't hear anything. Oh no, the baby can hear absolutely everything with crystal clarity, because because the baby has never been exposed to an atmosphere, so there is unbroken liquid from the mother's abdomen all the way through the the uterus. The liquid's in there, and all the way to the eardrum. There's not a single bubble in there, and and when you have solid liquid going in there. It's a perfect transmitter of sound. So if, if you've got a pregnant woman that's you know, got a developing a baby and you're just having a conversation, that baby is hearing it with every bit of the clarity you are. It just it's, it's not oh, 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 oh. It sounds perfect. So it's it's you know sometimes when people say oh you know oh, he's reacting to his dad's voice or he likes a certain piece of music, probably is. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any uh, particular voice that's just been difficult? Well, uh, the one that I get sort of corrected most uh, by the director is uh, Harriman from Foster's Home. They particularly liked a sort of blustery sound. I would sort of make me sponsors. Sort of that. You know, Google is what I mean to be father. They like to sort of that I would add to it. And as time would go through the session, I would start to lose that until he was just like, Miss Falsis, you know, I kind of lost that. 
And so she would be like, Rad, no, you lost the blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then the saw, like, you know, I have to go back and look up a few lines. We, we were watching Hotel Transylvania, and I was cracking up every time Dracula said, Well, these weekly blah, 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 blah. I don't do blah, 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 blah. All I'm thinking of is, that's what my problem is. I do do blah, blah, blah. <laughs> 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 forget to. Where's? <laughs> Anything else? Other secrets, magic? Well, uh, like I said, if, if uh, you know it is something you guys want to pursue, there there are uh, resources online now that just never I never even imagined ten years ago, much less thirty, which is when I was here. Oh my God. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it uh, you know it is possible. Like I said, every year somebody gets into it. You know, the geezers drop off, they back in. Somebody's got to replace them. Anything else? Huh? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. you. Good on you.